Well, aside from my sermon notes being locked in a computer and I can't get them to print out, I'm going to wing it this morning. But um, I got a confession to make. This was the same lesson from the lectionary that showed up in 2019, my first Christmas season with Epworth Church. I skipped this one. Why? Because I wanted y'all to like me. I've told you before that when United Methodist pastors go in front of the Board of Ordained Ministry, we have to tell them what the story of call in the scriptures like ours. And mine started out being the call of Sarah in the Old Testament, Abraham's wife, who when she was called and told she was going to have a baby at a late age, laughed. Because when God started to speak in my heart and say, I really want you to be a pastor, I laughed and everyone who'd ever known me laughed when I said it to them. But now it's Jeremiah, because Jeremiah... All he wants to do is go in and say things that make people like him and be popular and not stir up any trouble, but he's got a fire in his bones, which is the title of my blog, which I will get back to writing now that I can write again with my arm and type and things like that. It's been quite a year. It's been quite a year. It's the first day of the new year. It was quite a year. Let's say it that way. But who wants to preach this? Because nobody wants to hear this. We're in Christmas mode, aren't we? You're all still, how many of you still have your tree up? I hope most of you still have your tree up. Unless it's a fire hazard, then take it down. I hope you're still listening to Christmas carols. You cannot find one on a radio right now. But Christmas continues through Epiphany, which is the 6th of January. We're just ready to pack it all in, aren't we? We have some flowers up here that are still looking pretty good. But they'll be gone probably by next Sunday as well. So who wants to hear about babies being butchered by a king? Nobody. Nobody wants to hear that story, but it's part of the truth of what God is doing to us and Jesus for us in Jesus Christ, not to us, for us in Jesus Christ. One of the things I had in there trying to print out that I can't quite memorize is on my Facebook page for those who are my Facebook friends. It's a quote from Thomas Merton about in this world, this demented inn in which there's absolutely no room for him, Christ comes uninvited. That's all I can remember of that great poem from Thomas Merton, a 20th century mystic and priest. Into this demented inn, this world with, that has absolutely no room for him, Christ comes uninvited. And we read in both Isaiah and in the letter to the Hebrew people this morning, that Christ's suffering is what brings him close to our hearts and our experience, which is why God entered human life as a human being. Now, it's an amazing story, isn't it? King Herod, who for all intents and purposes was the most powerful man other than the Roman emperor in the Israel, in Jerusalem, in that whole region, he was powerful, and yet he fears a baby boy. What does that say about him? What a coward he is, that he has to kill them all to make sure he gets that one. What does it say about this baby other than he is who we know him to be, the King of kings and Lord of lords of all things? And Jesus enters life basically as a refugee. Now, it's going to get political, so get yourselves ready. I was saddened to see that on Christmas Eve, a southern governor put immigrants on a plane and flew them to the vice president's home and left them out there, including infants. There was a child less than 10 months old in that group. There was a man who had no shoes. He had double pairs of socks. And you know how cold it was Christmas Eve. I was trying to drive home Christmas Eve. I had to stop in the parking lot and let my car warm up because I forgot my gloves and my hands were too cold to hold my steering wheel. The wind shall got 13 below zero in Washington, D.C., and yet we're going to play games with people's lives because they have no power. These are people who came here looking for a home, looking for safety, because people still see America as the city on a hill, the place where you come to have a better life, only to be put on a plane and flown into a strange place where they don't know the language, being told they were going to go to a place where they could register for legal immigration status and be given work as migrant farmers. Instead, they're dumped in the middle of the District of Columbia in 13 below zero weather, wearing nothing but socks, no shoes, no jackets, nothing. 
having walked from Venezuela to the United States border. Now, people will say to me, that's not what that means with scripture. Because some people will say, this is absolutely the word of God, and I believe in the word of God. But the word of God is very clear when it comes to people coming to a nation. You shall welcome the sojourner, you shall welcome the alien, because once you were slaves in Egypt, I am the Lord your God. When anything is punctuated with I am the Lord your God, it gets my attention. People will say to me, that's not what that means, though. I'll say, what does that mean? That means legal immigration. Well, I don't know that Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus pulled up to the INS office in uh, Egypt when they got there, but they found a home there because their lives were endangered. And I'm not trying to make this about immigration because I'm not saying that biblical policy should be public policy. I'm not saying we should throw the borders open to anyone, but just don't blame scripture and don't say Christian nationalism because those two words do not go together because of passages like this. But we live in a demented end, don't we, this world? It's crazy. It's filled with all sorts of terror and hardship and pain, which is why we have to preach this story every three years. I opted for Simeon and Anna my first year. Simeon saying, now I can die in peace because I've seen my salvation. That's that last verse of the song we just sang, saints before the altar bending, long in hope and fear, suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. That's Simeon and Anna. That's a happier story to tell than this one, but this is why Christ came. Christ came for those of us who struggle. Christ came for those of us who get it wrong. Christ came for those of us who sometimes get it right. Christ came for those of us who have enough to eat. Christ came for those of us who don't have anything. Christ came for the suffering of the world, but he also came for those of us who have the ability to help those who are struggling. Just remember that Jesus did not have an easy road, even as an infant. Just like the shepherds that night, they went away rejoicing. Now they went away to their poverty rejoicing. They didn't go, they didn't leave there suddenly to go to the palace and be allowed in with everyone else. They didn't go there to have their lives completely changed, but they knew in their hearts everything had changed because their Savior had come. And this morning what we're going to do is what Methodist people have done for years. Now, the ladies who take care of my mom, most of them are from African nations, and they say to me, you have a watch night service? And I said, no, we don't have watch night services. Any of you grew up going to Methodist watch night services on New Year's Eve where you sit in church for four, six, eight hours waiting for the new year to sing praise to God? I asked one of the ladies who was with my mother last night, said, she said, did you make it till midnight? I said, no, I fell asleep. And she, I said, were you up at midnight? She said, I had to pray at midnight. I had to pray at midnight because I couldn't be at church. So we're going to do what Methodist folks have done since the days of John Wesley. We're going to renew our covenant with God. We're going to renew the covenant that was made in Christ. We're going to renew our part in that covenant as soon as we sing another hymn. Because we're going to remember that it is God and God alone who brings us salvation. It's not anything we deserve or anything that we could work for, anything we could possibly earn, but it is a gift to us. We're called to share it with others. So I hope this year you will look at the world a little bit differently, a little bit more gently. People who want to be here, work with your representatives to find a way for people coming here not to end up on a plane dumped in a cold place in the middle of the night. Doesn't mean we had everybody in without any sort of plan or, or government restrictions. I'm not saying that it makes good public policy, I'm just saying don't say this was God's plan. God's plan is for anyone who comes to the people of God to find welcome. I am glad to say that the folks who have welcomed the refugees from the other nations are mostly church folks, mostly congregations who have opened their hearts and their homes. Reminds me of the war in Ukraine when people in Poland opened their doors to people they didn't know who spoke a different language and let them in with their families. That's the demented inn we live in that Christ comes into our hearts to open them to him, to each other. Now, I'm trying to pick my word for the year. A friend of mine does that every year. He picks a word for the year that he focuses his prayer life on, his ministry on, his heart on. This morning I texted him. I said, I need your word for this morning. I played it my first word of word because it happened to be five letters, adapt. Mine, I think, is going to be wholeness. We need to seek wholeness for one another on this planet until Christ comes again. 
understanding that we are here because we are saved by Christ and Christ alone, by grace alone. Now this is a mangled mess of what I was going to preach, but I can't get my notes out of the computer. We couldn't get the bulletins out of the computer. We're starting off with a bang. But Christ is with us, that I know, whatever happens this year. My last few years have been pretty tough, i got to tell you that. Not coming here, but selling my house was tough, ruined my knee and then my sacroiliac and everything else. Now my mother's in hospice in my home. I lost my husband. It was my seventh Christmas without him. I had a tough stretch of things going on. Someone said to me, maybe your 2023 will be a great year, and I said, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not going to say this is the year that everything's going to go my way. But I know without a doubt that God is already there. God will welcome me into this year. God will see me through whatever happens this year. And for that, I am grateful. So I think my word is going to be wholeness this year. I will pray every day for your wholeness as I pray for your children every day by name. I add to the list. I've added college students now to the list. Those who teach, I've added to the list. I hope you're continuing to pray. When we gave you those prayer cards back in September for kids going to school, I hope you pray for your children every day and expand it to pray for the children of this community, this nation, and throughout the world so we can spread wholeness in the name of Jesus our Christ. So let us now stand up and sing. Sing we now of Christmas, and then we'll renew our covenant before God together. <laughs> 